Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the second Critical Antiquities Workshop of 2021. Um, we're very happy to have you all here and to have um, Professor Sarah Brill um, with us. I want to begin by acknowledging the um, traditional um, custodians of the land on which uh, at least the University of Sydney is situated. We can't take account of all of the traditional custodians everywhere, um, everyone that's participating. Um, but the University of Sydney sits on the country of the Gadigal people, of the Eora Nation, and we want to pay respects to um, elders past, present and emerging. Um, we also want to acknowledge that this is stolen land and that um, the University of Sydney is part of a, a, a very broad um, structural problem of colonialism um, for which you know, the effects are ongoing and um, extremely destructive. Um, but we um, are very happy to have you here today and um, apologies for those who are um, frequent attendees, but I'm gonna just uh, give a little introduction to the Critical Antiquities Network uh, and this workshop for those who haven't already attended. Um, so the Critical Antiquities Network uh, was established um, last year by Ben Brown and I, um, both at the University of Sydney and the Department of Classics and Ancient History. Uh, and the network aims to connect scholars working between various um, uh, ancient traditions and contemporary critical theories. Um, the idea of a critical antiquity, for Ben and I at least, is to treat antiquity um, in, uh, in a relational way. And that relationship is characterised um, by two, two ideas. Uh, it's to treat antiquity as a standpoint from which to grasp the nature of um, our present and thereby to be able to critique it. Um, but it's also dually to treat antiquity as the object of critique, as we simultaneously recognize that there are deleterious forms of thought and practice in antiquity, uh, not merely in our own modern context. Now, Ben and I think that uh, among modern thinkers, Karl Marx inaugurates and perhaps best exemplifies this kind of approach to critique. Uh, and he and I have um, been spending quite a lot of time thinking about Marx's mode of engagement with antiquity. Um, and we note that, you know, in the course of his lifelong critical endeavor, uh, Marx draws on Greek and Roman, as well as Peruvian, Slavic, um, and other antiquities in his work um, in order to grasp the present and critique it. Um, we also, with the network, want to um, bring a broad range of ancient traditions into the network. Uh, and for that reason, it's, I think it's apt that the University of Sydney being situated in um, Australia, home to some of the oldest continuing civilizations um, on earth uh, is, is a place where we can undertake this, this kind of endeavor. Um, but although Marx is, is crucial uh, for Ben and, and my thinking, um, we're not limited to a Marxian approach. Um, we like to use the term critical theories rather than critical theory, um, which could be confined to say the Frankfurt School um, critical theories, rather, is uh, Martin Saar's term, and he uses it to recognise the very broad range of contemporary thinkers who, in the spirit of the Frankfurt School, but also distinct from it, uh, question the quality of rational thought in modernity, uh, the forms of domination that modernity instantiates, and the ways that we might emancipate ourselves. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let me hand it over to uh, Ben Brown, who will be emceeing uh, today's session, and uh, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Tristan, uh, for introducing the network. Um, it is now my great pleasure to, to be able to introduce Professor Sarah Brill, um, who joins us um, uh, this morning in Australia and uh, in the evening yesterday, <laughs> or today, um, from Fairfield University in Connecticut. Um, and it is a great pleasure in particular because Professor Brill's work exemplifies, I think, the project that Tristan and I are seeking to advance in the Critical Antiquities Network and in this workshop series. Um, Professor Brill works at the intersection of contemporary critical theory and Greek philosophy, especially Plato and Aristotle. Um, in 2013, she published a study of Plato on the limits of human life, and last year published her important critique of the reception of Aristotle's politics, ethics, and Historia Animalium, entitled Aristotle and the concept of the shared life uh, with Oxford University Press. 
This last work undertakes what will no doubt, I think, be just the beginning of a long process that we'll all need to grapple with, which is rethinking human political community in a more inclusive and a more expansive way. In this work, Professor Brill has thrown down the gauntlet, I think, to an entire tradition, which has interpreted Aristotle's foundational texts through the lens of a Renaissance and early modern Christian humanism. On one level, the task is deceptively simple, which is to listen much more attentively to what Aristotle is saying about the relationship between forms of human life and forms of non-human life. What has intervened, of course, are the specific historical conditions that human life has taken over the last 500 years without naming, uh, well, let's name it, it's, uh, it's capitalism. Um, to read Aristotle as, as Professor, Professor Brill reads him is therefore, I think, an act of political resistance to a humanism that excludes the animal and animality from the domain of humanity and mandates all that that such type of exclusion will permit. In reading ancient texts like this, Professor Brill also challenges the relegation of the non-human to the worlds of figures, simile and metaphor, a form of exclusion at the level of hermeneutics. In that sense, her work is very powerful for the uncomfortable but timely confrontation it sets up. We are not like animals, we are animals. Reading Aristotle more carefully, therefore, is to return to a very ancient problem indeed and to open it up to new modes of inquiry, but one which still asks perhaps the most important political question of all, which is what kind of animal are we? So today, Professor Brill continues this work and we are very grateful that she is sharing it with us on our Critical Antiquities Workshop series. And she will present a paper entitled Aristotle, Biopolitics and the Iliad. Ben, thank you so much for that very kind and thoughtful introduction. And to both Ben and Tristan, thank you both for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm honored and uh, so very delighted to be part of this network and part of the work that you're doing in uh, bringing these two modes of engagement to classical antiquity. So this is very exciting for me. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to the audience for your presence here today slash tonight. Uh, it will be, I hope, uh, a very uh, lively conversation. So, and also an enormously generous amount of time. Uh, and I'm a bit worried about taxing everyone's attention. So I thought perhaps uh, we could structure our time in this way. I could say just a few brief comments about how this engagement with the Iliad arose both from the uh, previous project that Ben just so kindly glossed uh, um, Aristotle on the concept of shared life, uh, talk a little bit about the place where this particular piece is going, and a little bit about future work that arose from working on this particular piece. And then I thought I'd just read a bit of it, uh, and then open the floor for us to, to discuss. So um, the most immediate impetus for this engagement with the Iliad was really thinking through a couple of claims that arose out of work on um, Aristotle on the concept of shared life. The phrase shared life is how I'm translating the Greek word Susan. Um, it, it also has that sense of living together or living with. Uh, I conceive of it as it functions in Aristotle's politics and ethics as the forms of intimacy that arise from the possession of language and the capacity for choice. So we see it at work in human political life in the capacity for shared affect for shared perception and for shared contemplation. But Aristotle talks about it as particularly vivid in those moments in which uh, people share their most cherished activities with one another. Uh, so he'll say the most vivid dimension of living together or sharing life is when we do things together. Uh, he includes drinking and hunting, but also philosophizing and theorizing. So in looking at the way that this term functions in Aristotle's politics and his ethics, I argue for three sort of large points. One, that human political life is a form of intimacy that is an intensification of rather than a rupture with animal sociality. 
I also argue that uh, that uh, intensification is a function of the particular conception of Zoe with which Aristotle is operating. Zoe that functions less in the form of a kind of reduced mirror or bare life, but rather in the form of uh, an object of desire uh, that what constitutes the living of any particular being is the most intense, most vivid forms of activity activity of which it is capable. Uh, so Zoe then functions in a way to connect living being to a, a larger conception of power. So if we think about uh, Foucault's sort of distinction between sovereign power as uh, the power to take life, biopolitical power as the power to make live, I think in Plato and Aristotle, we see a conception of uh, the generation of life as an index of power. So who is generative of Zoe, under what circumstances, and how uh, becomes a central feature of Aristotle's political theory and concept of politics. So the notion of politics that would come out of a system that views the generation of life as the primary index of power is what I describe as Zoe politics. Uh, it treats uh, the management of human generativity as central to the political project. And in Aristotle's thinking, I argue that we see that role of politics, that is, as the management of human and generativity, particularly clearly in the eugenics legislation, of course, of politics seven, but also in the very model of ownership that comes out of the critique of uh, the sort of platonic Socrates's conception of, of shared or common ownership in politics too. There, Aristotle will say that the very first possession is uh, the sustenance granted to newborns, so the yolk of the egg or the milk of the bread rest, which he treats not as a product of maternal labor, but as a gift of nature. So I see that as encapsulating a kind of alienated approach to natality that informs his conception of, uh, of em the embodiment of animals and the nature of the polis. So the hope was to develop further this notion of Zoe politics and to think carefully about how it differs from biopolitics, what it offers an analysis of, of power and capacity that biopolitics does not. Um, my sense is that uh, if we really want to get at the degree to which uh, generativity is central to an understanding of capacity and power in the ancient world, we really need something beyond biopolitics to do that. But we also need a really nuanced understanding of the relationship between contemporary biopolitical concerns and ancient concerns that do seem to clearly resonate with the concerns of biopolitics. So you know, when Aristotle uh, bothers to identify the age at which humans should start procreating or to make uh, a sort of clear designations about the form of gymnastics that should be supplied in early childhood education, uh, he clearly is touching upon on um, a set of concerns that overlap with what we would tend to call biopolitical concerns. But I think we need to really be careful about attributing that kind of interest on Aristotle's part to a, a kind of biopolitics for at least two reasons. One, it's not at all clear that Aristotle operates with a conception of, you know, two of the most essential um, ideas that are encapsulated by biopolitics. One, the notion of population, uh, and two, the notion of kind of reductive biological process. For all of the ways that Aristotle talks about uh, human uh, collectives, the multitude, the plethos, the people, the demos, the many, the hoi polloi, uh, we get a sense that their connection to one another is a function of the human capacity for the shared perception of justice. Uh, and so what provides the political bond, what provides what I'm describing as a very unique form of intimacy is that capacity to share not only a conception of what constitutes the good and how to attain it, but a perception of what is just
just and unjust? What should be allocated to whom and when and under what circumstances? And so the calibration of perception becomes a central feature of uh, political life, especially life in the aspirational city that Aristotle develops in seven and eight. And I'm just not sure how easily that sits with the uh, notion of population. If we follow the sociologist Bruce Curtis, population is a kind of statistical artifact uh, that arose when it became possible to replace status with number. Um, that's a, a, a kind of motion that I think would have been the abrogation of status to number would have been inimical to Aristotle, uh, who wants to in many ways retain status uh, above all, uh, right? Uh, his beef with Socrates of the Republic in part is this notion that he uh, attributes to Socrates that rule is one, uh, whereas for Aristotle it is uh, irreducibly heterogeneous. So the question then is, do we encounter something like population in Aristotle. And, and similarly for biological processes, right? Of course, Aristotle is clearly preoccupied with periodicity, with the cycles of gestation, maturation, and growth. Uh, but we don't have the same sense of these as reductive processes. I think for Aristotle, they, uh, they uh, express a kind of attempt to imitate the eternal circuits or orbits of the highest celestial bodies. They're an attempt to imitate the divine. And so they don't have that sense of reduction that uh, a number of biopolitical thinkers would attribute to biological processes there. I mean, the very word biological doesn't have an easy Greek translation. When we look at the, the logos of bios that Aristotle offers, it's very different than what we tend to mean with this word biological. So, so on the one hand, I want to just exercise some caution uh, in attributing to Aristotle a kind of bio biopolitical framework, given uh, concerns about the applicability of concepts like population and uh, reductive sense of biological processes. But at the same time, Aristotle clearly instrumentalizes human life. He is very clear that citizens are, at times he calls them the hule, the material of the city, the equipment of the city, the possession of the city. When he compares citizens to material, uh, when he treats them as the property of the city, when he claims that the lives of citizens should be more regimented than the lives of their slaves, when he characterizes those slaves as living tools, I think he most clearly approximates what concerns so many thinkers about the, the production of kind of biological uh, or, or biopolitical power. That is the, the formulation of the human to follow Hannah Arendt as one man of gigantic dimensions. Uh, and this should concern us uh, for all kinds of reasons. So it's not as though we couldn't say of Aristotle that there is a concern with uh, the processes of life as a distinctly political concern uh, for humans. I think the question rather is, can we reduce that concern to a conception of bios? Uh, Brooke Holmes, I think, puts this very nicely when she asks us to question the degree to which the, the prefix bio is really a translation of bios itself. So I wanted to look at some other ways in which, or some other sort of influential um, accounts or formations of human collective that might help us understand this other reductive dimension of Aristotle's thinking, the sense of uh, citizens as property of the city who are you know, expected to kind of farm out their, their sperm and wombs in, uh, in liturgy to the polis or who are expected to perform uh, the deeds or the work of the city as it is outlined in conjunction with their life cycles. So that's what brought me to the kind of iconography of shared life in the Iliad, uh, that the way in which the actions of collective Achaean and Trojan forces are figured in the Iliad present 
a model in which a conception of Zoe, a conception of life and living being is understood to impart a sense of cohesion and unity and common purpose that for Aristotle will be definitive of animals that are politicos. So we see this, this particular piece as doing a kind of genealogical work of looking at how Aristotle might have arrived at a conception of, of plethos and demos and hoi polloi. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to a reading here uh, and um, uh, we'll work through a couple of passages. There are a couple of lengthy passages from uh, the Iliad that I'll read. Um, if it's possible to post those through a link in the chat, Tristan, that'd be great. But if not, really, that's no big deal. Um, okay, so, no. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. So um, I'll just kind of talk through my general thesis and then and then work through a couple of sections on the Iliad. Uh, so my primary claim is that Aristotle's sense of the sharing of the perception of justice as the common deed that comprises human political life is informed by an Iliadic model, the harnessing of isthesis and logos alike for the pursuit of a common task. As with Aristotle, the root of this model is found in the very conception of living as it is accomplished by a variety of animal kinds. For both uh, Homer and Aristotle, Zoe emerges as a, co a collectively pursued enterprise requiring fluid combinations of coalescences and diffusions of force and capacity, a variety of organizations in a very particular and trans-individual sense. In the Iliad, prior to the reduction of people to things, armies have become packs and swarms, heroes have become walls and rivers, peoples have become sand and stars. My hope then is to trace the conception of political power as the power to generate what Homer calls the boundless people, the demos aperon, that emerges from out of the animal imagery for human collective action employed throughout the Iliad in order to illuminate the context from out of which Aristotle develops the conception of Zoe that undergirds his understanding of the formation of people and that complicates our assessment of the purported biopolitical character of Aristotle's thought. So this will really take uh, uh, two sections. One, where I, I'll just establish the metaphorics at work uh, in uh, Homer's depiction of collective Achaean and Trojan action. And then in the second section, we'll really look at the forms of utterance that are available out of uh, that sort of depiction of, um, of collective action. So we'll start with a section entitled Swarms, Flocks, and Herds. The collection of metaphors Homer uses in order to describe the actions of the Achaean and Trojan armies is wide ranging, but consistently returns to favored tropes drawn from three, three sources. One, plant, animal, insect, and human life, whereby Achaeans and Trojans are likened to leaves and grass, to swarms of bees, flies, and wasps, to flocks of birds, goats, and sheep, to schools of fish, to packs of wolves, hounds, and jackals, to reapers, farmers, weavers, loggers, and tanners. And then second, to elemental forces like waves, wind, storm, fire, river, and stars. And then third, to inanimate and inert environmental features, walls of stone, cliffs of granite, beaches of sand. Each of these groups of metaphors emphasizes different but interlocking aspects of collectives of men. The imagery of animals and plants present animal and vegetal heterogeneous unity. Swarms and flocks stress not only the communal nature of the action, but also the varieties of organization, the malleability of structure, and the shifting morphology of which such groups are capable. Leaves and grasses juxtapose the fragility of human life with the endurance of human deeds, emphasizing the tension between a strength and number and the ephemeral and vulnerable nature of individual constituents. Wave and fire, on the other hand, comprise a homogenous unity, 
So if the animal and vegetal metaphors function as something like organs, uh, wave and fire function as homeomeries, uh, as, as indicating a kind of homogeneous unity like blood uh, that conveys the efficacy held by Achaean and Trojan horses. Stone, especially granite, contains this efficacy and holds it together. We don't see anything here of inert, passive, or mere matter. Even the stones are animated by purpose. Rather, taken together, these images provide a metaphorics for describing different regimes of force. For if it is true, following Simone Weil's formulation, that force is the poem's ultimate protagonist, it is equally the case that force is not simply treated as monolithic, Rather, the Iliad highlights a number of organizations and dispersions of force, and it is particularly inclined to use animal collectives in order to do so, presenting a variety of what we could call zoe regimes. Through such imagery, Homer confronts his audience with a spectrum of capacity, such that the power of herd and field, for instance, coalesces into the force of wave or stone, and then, or wave or storm rather, and then crystallizes into stone, and occasionally shatters into sand or refracts into stars. The actions this imagery seeks to illuminate, the deeds that are allotted to the Achaeans and the Trojans on Mars can be relatively clearly identified for when they gather for assembly or for battle. And here, the imagery of flocks of birds and beasts abound, but also the gathering of waves and thunderheads, as well as one of the few references to a swarm of bees. In addition to gathering, they affirm. And here, the image of roaring waves is again frequently evoked and serves to portray the collective Achaean army less as a deliberative body than an evaluative body, or even insofar as their participation in assembly is characterized most frequently as giving assent as an affirming body. Then in addition to gathering and affirming, they disperse, either to reconvene on the battlefield or to their respective camps and campfires, likened to stars or in a few instances in terror to ships or behind city walls. And here again, they're depicted as swarming. And then finally, they fight. And their fighting is likened to fire, to river, and to a variety of animals. That fighting can then be further divided into defensive fighting, where they're presented as walls of stone or cliffs of granite, and offensive, right, which involves a kind of distance fighting as well as hand-to-hand -hand combat. Many of these scenes strain the boundaries of deliberative communal action. At times, they depict groups organized by shared fighting habits and backgrounds. At others, assemblages of fighters drawn together by the exigencies of the battlefield. The lines between these actions are not always clear, and Homer's imagery just as often troubles these distinctions as asserts them. In some passages, multiple metaphors are used to get at the action being described, as, for instance, in the very first description of the armies gathering on the plain, in which they are likened to fire, flocks of birds, leaves, flowers, and swarms of flies. So this would be the first passage on the handout. Uh, and this is using Lattimore's uh, translation, which I think in this case is, is more useful, even if it's less beautiful than, uh, than Fagel's. So here we go. As obliterating fire lights up a vast forest along the crests of a mountain and the flare shows far off, so they marched. From the magnificent bronze, the gleam went dazzling all about through the upper air to the heaven. These, as the multitudinous nations of birds winged, of geese and of cranes and of swans and long-throated uh, in the Asian meadow beside the Castrium waters, this way and that make their flights in the pride of their wings, then settle in clashing swarms and the whole meadow echoes with them. So of these multitudinous tribes from the ships and shelters poured to the plain of Scamandros, and the earth beneath their feet and under their feet of their horses thundered horribly. They took their position in the blossoming meadow of Scamandros, thousands of them, as leaves and flowers appear in their season like the multitudinous nations of swarming insects who drive hither and thither about the stalls of the sheepfold, in the season of spring when the milk splashes in the milk pails. In such numbers, the flowing haired Achaeans stood up through the plain against the Trojans, hearts burning to break them. 
In book 14, wave, fire, and wind are used to describe the war cries of both Achaean and Trojan, and none are adequate. The metaphorics exhausts itself. So this is our, our second passage. The two sides together are closed together with a great war cry. Not such is the roaring against dry land of the sea's surf as it rolls in from the open under the hard blast of the north wind. Not such is the bellowing of fire and its blazing in the deep places of the hills when it rises in flaming the forest. Nor such again the crying of the wind in the deep haired oaks when it roars highest in its fury against them. Not so loud as now the noise of Achaeans and Trojans in voice of terror rose as they drove against one another. In other passages, the same imagery is used to describe a variety of actions, producing a series of elisions. So in the passages that we just read, we see this kind of proliferation of uh, uh, our generative, uh, generativity of images in order to get at a single action. But we also see a kind of reverberation of a single image used to uh, depict multiple actions. This is especially the case for assembly and battlefield whose delineation is often blurred by the persistent imagery of waves to describe the gathering for assembly, the roaring of ascent, the amassing for battle, and the fighting itself. Gathering for battle and fighting are also brought together. For instance, both the amassing of the armies and the fighting around a corpse evoke imagery of swarms of insects. And the connection between assembly and fighting implicit in this chain of images is furthered by the connection between the roaring in assembly, the sound of cries and screams on the battlefield, and the increasing indistinctness of these battlefield utterances from the sounds of weapons clashing and blows thudding. This is also an elision of the roaring of mouths and the thundering of feet of utterance and deployment. With the addition of the clashing of shields and spears, we have then a disintegration of the distinction be between hand and mouth and foot, a kind of disarticulation of the body. The portrait of the Achaean and Trojan armies that emerges from this poetic constellation is that of a body subject to a variety of coalescence coalescences and diffusions of force. In this, they are not distinct from the bodies of heroes themselves, save in the particular form these sort of congealings and dispersions take. And even these can be performed by heroes under extreme circumstances. One of the indexes of Achilles' uncanny greatness as it's presented is that he becomes like an army swarming around and into the Trojan, tranks, uh, Trojan ranks. Heroes become microcosmic armies, armies become macrocosmic heroes. So, so now uh, I think we have a sense of the, the kind of breadth and depth of the metaphorics that work here, particularly this use of animal collectives or living collectives. I want to focus on how they impact the presentation of speech and uh, the full arc of vocal utterance in, uh, in the poem. So in presenting their collective action in assembly and on the battlefield, Homer emphasizes the role of speech in accomplishing both coalescence and diffusions of force. He presents this capacity as a source of vulnerability as well as strength. Deliberation is not consistently a privileged. Assent can be given to bad advice as well as good, as when, for instance, the Trojans give assent to Hector rather than Polydamas, their wits having been clouded by Athena. Homer describes an arc of human utterance from muthoi, speeches, to apainoi, shouts of approval, to yakai, cries. And it's worth lingering over the Iliad's illustration of those contexts in which linguistic idiosyncrasy recedes into the background and shared utterance comes to the fore. The effect of these passages is to both illustrate human aggression and reveal its limits. For instance, Achilles' sort of famous assertion of a radical alienation between Hector and himself, right? He says there, there are no trustworthy oaths between men and lions, nor wolves and lambs. This assertion of radical uh, divergence uh, is called into question by the very medium in which he utters it. 
When the cries of battle meshed with the clash of weapons and the thudding sound of blows and falling bodies, the Iliad blurs the boundary between speech and cry, draws attention to the murmur underneath the speeches of the assembly, the hum of the army that could at any moment burst into cry, and confronts its audience with the underlying connection between word and deed. When this connection mingles with the other elements of spectacle, uh, the glittering, dazzling, rippling play of weapons and men, as well as the kind of uh, counterbalancing, grinding, sort of foggy, dusty work involved in battle, the poem suggests an ambivalence and even suspicion about speech and its connection with other forms of utterance. Homer complicates this play between attachment and isolation in his characterization of the organization of the Trojan forces. Disguised as Priam's son Polides, Iris addresses the Trojan assembly gathered in front of Priam's door. So this I believe would be passage three. Old sire, dear to you forever are words beyond number as once when there was peace, but stentless war has arisen. In my time, I have gone into battle, into many battles among men, yet never have I seen a host like this, not one so numerous. They look terribly like leaves or the sands of the seashore as they advance across the plain to fight by the city. Hector, on you beyond all, I urge this to do as I tell you. All about the great city of Priam are many companions, but multitudinous is the speech of the scattered nations. Let each man who is their leader give orders to these men and let each set his citizens in order and lead them. Iris's advice echoes that of Nestor to Agamemnon earlier, insofar as she suggests an organization of troops that breaks them into smaller fighting units. Uh, once Agamemnon's near disastrous testing of the armies has been righted and the chaos it created quelled, Agamemnon receives some advice from Nestor about how to organize the Achaean troops. So this is passage four. Set your men in order by tribes, by clans, Agamemnon, and let clan go in support of clan, let tribe support tribe. If you do it this way and the Achaeans obey you, you will see which of your leaders is bad and which of your people, and which also is brave since they will fight in divisions and might learn also whether by magic you fail to take this city or by men's cowardice and ignorance of warfare. The relationship between organization and disclosure that Nestor's advice asserts is worth paying attention to. The fighting capacities of both captains and men will become apparent if the army is organized into smaller groups determined by shared living and fighting habits. Nestor claims that such an arrangement will reveal the courage or cowardice of the captain and the fighting prowess or lack thereof of the men. Such formations disclose what is praiseworthy or blameworthy they bring to light and allow it to be assessed with respect to its excellence or lack thereof. What allows this kind of formation to be disclosive is that it forms smaller groups of praise and blame, smaller contexts of surveillance, loyalty, and fear of dishonor, a smaller collectivity whose members are answerable to one another. Such a grouping harnesses senses of loyalty, competition, and shame in such a way as to further collective action rather than compete for it it acts as a way of separating out that in fact unifies toward a single purpose. However, because the Trojan army consists not only of Trojans, but of troops not bound by a single language, this organization includes an isolation of one fighting mass from another. Because individual heroes can speak to one another across Achaean and Trojan lines, it is in the collective of Trojan and Epicuroi forces that the effects of linguistic heterogeneity are felt. That this lack of linguistic cohesion can produce a lack of fighting cohesion is suggested by the description of the troops deployment subsequent to their organization. So this is uh, passage five. Now, when the men of both sides were set in order by their leaders, the Trojans came on with clamor and shouting like wildfowl, as when the clamor of cranes goes to high to the heavens, when the cranes escape the winter time and the rains unceasing and clamorously wing their way to the steaming ocean, bringing to the Pygmean men bloodshed and destruction. At daybreak, they bring on the baleful battle against them. But the Achaean men went silently, breathing valor, stubbornly minded each in his heart to stand by the others. 
So here, Homer is explicitly juxtaposing the utterance of the Trojan forces with the silence of Achaean troops. What the possession of a single tongue affords, the, the Achaeans is silent deployment. Uh, Homer illustrates this again when he argues that, or, uh, states that the Danes, and this is just a small quotation, went silently. You would not think all these people with voices kept in their chests were marching silently in fear of their commanders. And upon all glittered as they marched the shining armor they carried. By contrast, the Trojans marched, and this is your final passage, as sheep in a man of possession studying stand in their myriads waiting to be drained by their white milk and bleat interminably as they hear the voices of their lambs. So the crying of the Trojans went up through the, ar through the wide army. Since there was no speech nor language common to all of them, but their talk was mixed, who were called there from many far places. So on the one hand, we want to observe the initial disjunction of a key in silence and Trojan shouting. But the passage that follows emphasizes the sound of fighting, which includes not only the clash of weapons, but the shouts and cries of men. And in that passage, the silence of the Achaeans, as well as the so-called clamor of the Trojans, and the speeches that preceded this action, all devolve into the cries and screams of battle. And these utterances are taken up with the gleaming and glittering of weapons and shields and their clanging and clashing to produce the spectacle of battle. Thus, the Trojan forces' lack of common voice does not always prove an impediment for the action, and this is attested to in many passages in which speech has devolved into battle cry. The difference between the two armies vis-a-vis -vis linguistic homogeneity becomes less and less important as battle intensifies. Just a few more points here before we uh, uh, begin discussion. In its portrayal of Achaean or Trojan armies giving assent or voicing or an acting dissent, the Iliad offers us a glimpse of the preconditions for frank political speech. Neither mere noise nor argument, and yet deeply efficacious, these expressions of affirmation and dissent provide both the linguistic and deliberative substratum from which political speech emerges and the end toward which this speech aims. They are, in this sense, both the first and final causes of political speech. When we attend to the full range of utterance of which the armies are capable, noting also the significance of the capacity for silence granted by a shared speech, we see that these assertions of assent provide the basis for the efficacy of shared life. They make it possible to move or resist with the force of water, fire, and granite. But also in its illusion of expressing affirmation, gathering for assembly, amassing for battle, and fighting, that is, in its elision of linguistic, deliberative, and martial deeds, the Iliad conveys the vulnerability of speech in two senses. First, the vulnerability that belongs to speech, the tenuous line between speech and noise. And second, the vulnerability that speech opens up, the vulnerability to air, to which humans are exposed by being the animal that has speech and thus as subject to linguistic division as well as unity and to the possibility of being persuaded to act against one's interests. This ambivalence towards speech points to the real issue at stake here, the organization of force toward a common end. Speaking emerges as an aspect of human animality that can be more or less successfully, successfully harnessed to a single purpose. Through the poem, the group cohesion and communication of animal collectives illuminate the political bond between human forces as well as its rupture. The clamor of cranes and swarming of bees, for instance, figure the uh, cohesion and dispersion of force to which the human collectives are subject. What emerges from this imagery is a sense for the power of a common end to generate a people and the power of the people to bring about this end. In this, the human collective gives expression to a rule that is taken to be indicative of animality itself, that takes the living body as a regime and embodiment as already a politics. Even if we see here nothing of mere inert matter, and thus nothing of a population in the sense of an anonymous material over which power works, we nevertheless see the seeds of such a formulation in the very working of power that is the herd, the pack, and the swarm that crystallizes into a wall of stone or a cliff of granite and shatters into grains of sand, a force whose very efficacy can be turned against it, an instrumentalization of life 
that simply anticipates in very vivid terms what Aristotle will go on to formulate as a principle of Zoe itself, namely that it instantiates a form of rule. Thank you. Uh, so um, I think at this point, uh, we've been going for some time. And so I'd like to uh, hear uh, your thoughts um, and observations and uh, uh, would be happy, I, I believe if it's okay to go ahead and, and open the floor, if Ben and Tristan, that's all right with the two of you. We might, um... Uh, just uh, outline a few protocols for for questions. So rather than um, rather than people put up their hands, um, they could uh, uh, either put the letter Q in the chat, and then I'll 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 throw to them. Or if they're a little shy, they can always type the question in the chat, and I'll ask it on on your behalf. So so does anybody have any questions for? What was uh, an extraordinarily thought-provoking uh, paper um, and uh, a, a wonderfully unexpected uh, diversion through some beautiful Iliadic pieces um, and very thought-provoking questions that you raise about the nature of metaphor in epic as well, um, which is perhaps tangential to what you're working on, but, but enormously interesting to me particularly. But does anybody have... Um, any questions that will prevent me from taking over at this point? <laughs> um, James, you, you have a question. If you were, uh, I think you're on mute, on mute. Okay, um, hopefully everybody can hear me now. Um, um, I wanted to say thanks, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, my question is in relation to the social species, uh, as Plato mentions them in the Phaedo, um, mm -hmm. at around 82b, where mm -hmm. he talks about the bees and the wasps and the ants uh, as, as social species. Yeah. And uh, his point there um, seems to be that there's a way of uh, acquiring virtue um, through habituation, which is not the same way of acquiring virtue that we get through philosophy, through, a, through an intellectual engagement um, mm -hmm. with uh, other people and with um, virtue itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask um, whether Aristotle thought yeah. uh, about these social species. Yeah. Um, um, responds to Plato and yeah. his concern that we might have a drone-like performance of virtue um, yeah. if we um, acquire virtue uh, in an analogy um, uh, with the social species, the bees and, and the wasps and, and the ants. Um, yeah. I hope that's enough for a question. Thanks very oh. much. Mm. James, thank you. That's a, an incredibly rich question. Uh, and uh, I want to sort of take it from multiple directions all at once, which of course is not possible. But uh, I mean, I think that that you've hit on this very interesting sort of point of overlap between uh, Plato and Aristotle on the sort of notion of uh, kind of animal embodiment as uh, inherently significant or signifying uh, as meaningful, right? So, so both thinkers, I think, treat uh, Zoe as granting meaning. To be alive is to be not just efficacious, but signifying. Uh, and so we see that, of course, in the famous passage from the Phaedrus of cutting at the joints, right? Uh, but we see it also in the passage in the Phaedo you've just directed our attention to, and frankly, in the myth of Ur as well, where we're told that only... Uh, those who philosophize in a healthy way make good decisions. Uh, those who were just fortunate enough to be habituated in a good polis uh, are not given the tools needed to make good decisions about which form of life to choose. Uh, 
I think there are two ways to approach this question when we move to Aristotle. One would be to look at some comments he makes about animal embodiment in the history of animals, uh, mainly, although also to some extent in the parts of animals, where again, we're given this sense that animal embodiment is organized for the purpose of integrating within a particular environment. And frankly, this is really what Bios tends to mean for Aristotle is the integration into a topos. And we see some interesting wide variation. Plants don't need to move because they are so integrated into their topos, the earth in which they're planted, that that earth actually digests their food for them as a kind of prosthetic stomach, right? Uh, animals are uh, able to integrate on the basis of, of their, uh, or, or are even uh, nominated on the basis of their integration. Are they land animals or water animals, right? So embodiment itself seems to be taken as a kind of meaningful integration into topos. When we move to the human animal, we get to exactly the point that I think your question is really pressing. Um, are we seeing, you know, my argument is a, a kind of intensification of animal sociality, but the tendency has been to interpret it as a rupture, that the capacity for prohyresis is such a significant alteration in living as to make human ethical life just radically distinct. And so, for instance, the kind of courage, the, the deceptive appearance of courage in someone habituated as a soldier is not what Aristotle would describe as true courage, which requires risking death for the sake of the beautiful, right, and not falling back on one's training. But even there, I think that we don't escape this notion in Aristotle of a kind of embodiment that is born to exercise the freedoms of human ethical life. And we see that especially in these you know, profoundly disturbing passages about uh, nature intending to distinguish between the bodies of the free and the body of a slave. Uh, uh, and, and of course, you know, we have to note that Aristotle is clear that nature often fails to do so. But the point of the eugenics legislation in the aspirational city is to help nature uh, to produce a freeborn bodies. So uh, I think there, there is a compelling body of literature on the role of natural inclination toward virtue that continues to connect even the exercise of the capacity of, of deliberative choice with a kind of animal sociality. I'm sorry, James, that was such a long answer. Uh, but your thank question you, was, you. was very rich. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yep. We have a question from Charles. Great. Th thank you so much, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I apologize yes. for not using I apologize for not using my video. I'm hiding from my three year old in a closet right now. So <laughs> um, but um again, thanks so much. So uh, just to give you a sort of background from where I'm coming from with this question, I've actually written a book on Homeric force and its reception mm -hmm. um, that's under review with uh, classics and theory series actually so uh, awesome your series um or the one your book just came out with which is also really amazing and I, I wanted to sort of approach this question I mean just a quick thesis for me is force in Homer actually actively problematizes the the notion of the human subject mm -hmm. as an autonomous agent essentially mm -hmm. and this does mm -hmm. vibe in some sense with Simone Weil with mm -hmm. this idea of being an instrument of force but what mm -hmm. I really loved about your observations was this whole problem in Aristotle of uh, the problem of being autos autu, right? Of being in possession of oneself. That, is, of course, is the argument against the slave or why the slave belongs to the master. But so many people don't recognize that it's the same issue with the citizens, that even the citizens themselves are not autos autu. So I really enjoyed that point. And I think that is perhaps one of the very precise issues at work in the Iliad, right? Mm -hmm. Is who is in possession of themselves. I mean, this mm -hmm. is Achilles' problem, you mm -hmm. know, and it, there's a really nice passage when Achilles says to Hector, Athena mm -hmm. will kill you with my spear, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, mm -hmm. that really emphasizes the instrumentality mm -hmm. of humans. Mm -hmm. And I guess 
but with mm. with all of your observations, which were really fantastic on nature, I mean, I couldn't help but think about the Glaucus and Diomede speech, you know, the famous men, as are the generation of leaves. Yeah. And what's so key about that simile is the idea of growth, right? That the leaves that yeah. grow, the fusus that's involved. Yep. And so yeah. I was wondering how you see sort of perhaps fusus itself, this idea of growth as a way to connect uh, the Iliad and Aristotle. Um, mm. If you see any any relationship there, mm. Charles, thank you so much. Uh, your book sounds fantastic, and I'm very excited to get to read it. So it's very exciting that it's uh, on its way out, and I look very much forward to uh, to taking a look at it and really getting to dig into it. Uh, and I mean, you're right about this, like the degree to which a kind of sense of self possession is at stake here. I think that that's a foundational question. Um, so that idea of killing some Athena using my spear to kill you, remarkable. I mean, we see that also with uh, Clytemnestra and Aeschylus's Agamemnon, right? Where at one point she's saying, I, with my hand, killed Agamemnon, right? And then she's also saying, but I am, I am a representative of the curse that has worked its way through this sort of intergenerational trauma. So that, mm. that persistence of of questioning of self-possession, I think is, is profound and uh, incredibly interesting. Um, your question about Fuzes, like you just, you asked the question that Emma Bianchi, who uh, is here, has, has uh, asked me also before, uh, and I say that just to uh, assert your, your uh, good taste and acumen in question asking. It's an excellent question. I think so much has been said on the, on the topic of Fuzes. I think uh, where I'm really interested, where I think I, I could say something that might be helpful is uh, bound up with this notion especially in Aristotle, of, of Fusus, the, the kind of master craftsman. Um, and here, you know, Emma has a piece on the masculization of Fusus in Aristotle's work that I think is, is really valuable. Um, where I would like to focus our attention is on this claim that Aristotle makes in De Anima that uh, Fusus always constructs with a limit in mind. So Fusus as craftsperson is also limit providing. And that, you know, then invites this notion of a kind of, you know, uh, a, a form of uh, nomos at work, uh, nomos as a, a kind of limit making. So what does that mean for a conception of growth? Uh, growth is the kind of uh, course by means of which limits are put into place, right? Uh, and, and when we look at the parva naturalia, when we look at the conception of life that's at work in those small texts, we see something like that at play, right? That, that the, the entirety of life there is conceived as the careful regulation of heat, right? The careful sort of slow uh, controlled imposition of uh, cooling and management of heat. This is the work that the brain does. Uh, the uh, body is, is organized, of animals is organized hierarchically around a central archic principle. So I think that the aspect of Fusus that I have tended to want to emphasize is this notion of it providing a kind of law or limit. Um, and then the, the other dimension that we would need to say in the context of Aristotle is that whatever our conception of Fusus, it would need to accommodate the fact that uh, Aristotle sees it as usable in a comparative form. Uh, some things are more natural than others. Uh, so, so I think that would carry into any of the dominant conceptions of Fusus that we have tended to, to work with uh, as end, as internal principle of change, uh, and as limit giver. Does that uh, address uh, your very rich question at all, Charles? No, absolutely. This, if you can, you can see me nodding my head a lot if I can uh, be on video. So no, the, I mean, this idea of the limit, especially, I think that's really great. And um, yes, yeah, just this whole, and with that, how that involves with the collectivity that's involved also with collective death, essentially, yeah. which is at stake in, in war with the Iliad. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say one follow up with one other image, yeah, Charles? Yeah, no, thank you so I, much. Yeah. Uh, I think is really useful here. Um, in Plato's Laws, we get this very strange, very compelling image of legislation. Uh, and, and the stranger says this, you know, if we were attempting to paint something that only ever got more beautiful, 
right? We would have to have an intergenerational effort of correcting our painting because it would constantly have to be improved in order to keep up with its object. So this notion of legislation, or I would say more broadly, political life as a kind of collective attestation to capacity or force or vision of the good seems to be very much at work in this image that Plato produces in the laws, but also in this notion of citizens being the um, possession and material and equipment of the city, right? The, and that gets us into the quasi-organic uh, language that, that Aristotle uses to describe the polis, right? The, the, the language that gives rise to these debates about whether or not it's a substance. Uh, so, so Charles, just to throw that also into the fray as something to be thinking about and as an image to take a look at when we're thinking about these kinds of questions. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, first from Emanuela and then from Dimitri. Hi, thank you, uh, Sarah, for this incredibly uh, uh, rich paper. Um, I have possibly an anachronistic question, but uh, I, I hope it will be um, useful and, and generative indeed. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, I, I I see you drawing a connection between what you're talking about, you're talk, you, 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 you refer to as uh, generativity and this idea of a kind of af affective swarm, I don't know what, what you want to call it, right? Uh, uh, something that, that is at the level of uh, capacity, uh, a force, you know, maybe the Greek word we might want to put into play with that is dunamis. Um, versus a form of political regulation or rule that is not possible except in the domain of logos. Um, so uh, uh, I, I, I just, you know, you talk about this kind of trans, you talked at a certain point about transition. First of all, we've got these two forms of power. You might, we might want to parse them out as a, a puissance and pouvoir or something like this, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, 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 and secondly, we've got a domain of affect or affectivity or, you know, what we might call aesthesis. I know I'm being incredibly anachronistic here, <laughs> sort of like taking these modern conceptions and translating them back into Greek, but I hope mm -hmm. it's useful. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, uh, a domain of, of logos. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, an arche that can only really be... Uh, um, 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 put into practice via Logos. Mm. Um, so I, 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 you know, I just wonder how you're thinking about the, 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 the distinction between these two different kinds of power. And also I want to push you a little bit on that claim that somehow uh, um, political language or deliberation or something like that, or pol a political Logos somehow arises out of this uh, uh, substrate, I think, was the word that you used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though, so uh, thank you, Emma. These are fantastic, uh, very generative questions. Um, so I guess, you know, coming out of working on uh, History of Animals 8 and on this sort of uh, account that Aristotle is giving of animal ethos, right, animal character, and what that means in the context of non-human animals. Um, I think we, you, you, this is famously the place where Aristotle describes certain non-human animals as phronimos, uh, and we are left then to figure out what on earth that means, and, you know, is being phronimos the same thing as having phronesis? Uh, what are the limits there? And, you know, there's a, a, quite a, a body of substantive work on this question. Um, but, but it is really interesting to notice that, that the animals that are, are uh, characterized as Phronimos, almost all of them are politicos animals, and all of almost all of them exercise their phronema 
in order to have tight group cohesion, right? So Crane's use of the signal, for instance, is an, and use of a kind of sign that is understood by other Cranes is an example of this phronemous behavior. And it's, it exists to create group formation, uh, to forge a, a kind of uh, effective collective action within the herd. Uh, and the you know etymological connection between the uh, the herd and the quality of being gregarious and agame the verb you know to lead um, we I think see is really present uh, in in that discussion so I I wonder about uh, that notion that uh, kind of thoughtfulness is at work in the production of uh, a bond. So when I think about political, the political bond as a form of human intimacy, uh, I, I think about it in that sense in which uh, human embodiment is implicated, including the embodiment of teeth and tongue and lips that make speech possible, right? So, so I don't think we can divide the possession of logos from a kind of embodied animal reality in the way that certain interpretations of Aristotle have tended to do. So I would again argue, I mean, Pellegrin says, says something very similar, that, that we get a kind of, in his language, biological account of logos in the politics. And certainly some of this is just due to the idiosyncrasies of the politics, I think. But, but the notion of the possession of logos is a kind of like, again, intensification of this capacity for producing collective action, uh, I think is, is at work in what it means to rule or govern. Um, so that would be one way of approaching your question. Do you mind, could I just float one other possibility just for the sake of conversation? Um, and the other is that you'll, in, in the politics, right, Zoe itself is presented as a form of rule. You know, the Zoyan is the first uh, being for whom the soul rules the body. And for the vast majority of living beings, the mode of rule is mastery because humans purportedly have this more complicated soul then we also see an example of political rule in the relationship between deliberate or um, uh, rational and, and desiring soul. But for most living beings to be alive is to exhibit mastery. And that's of course implicated, this naturalization of mastery is implicated in the claim, the arguments about the natural slave. And so, so I think we do have to grapple with that as just simply endemic to Aristotle's political theory that, uh, that Zoyan itself is what it is by a principle of rule. Um, how that jives with the notion of soul as the form of a body having life as a capacity is something we really have to sit with. But, but it, it's important, I guess I just want to emphasize that it's important that in the politics Aristotle will ground a conception of ownership, a conception of living slaves, and an account of reproductive legislation, all in this notion of living as an instantiation of rule. So like, however else we think about what's going on in, in the politics and, and in the relationship between the politics and the zoological work, I think we need to have that in mind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Um, and Dimitris. Hello, Sarah. Thanks so much both for the talk and to the organizers for giving this talk together. It was uh, really stimulating. I just wanted to ask a question, going back to the, your initial remarks about uh, Zoe biopolitics and what you call Zoe politics. Um, and uh, I mean, to preface it by saying I'm very sympathetic and I think you're perfectly correct in sort of uh, uh, starting the discussion by saying, well, you know, the notion of Zoe there uh, 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 that we find in the ancients has nothing to do with their life. So, you know, bracket it out of this sort of Agamben framework. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I was just wondering, it's really a clarification. I was wondering the extent to which um, uh, we need to sort of consider uh, the virtue ethics that we find in Aristotle in terms of the question of zoopolitics or biopolitics. 
And there are various reasons for, for this. One is uh, that um, in Nicomachean ethics itself, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of not simply uh, uh, zin, but f zin, the good life, mm -hmm. is connected with virtue, with arity, right? So mm -hmm. already the two are connected. The virtue theory and the conception of the living are connected. So that's the first point. Then when we go to the development of the concept of biopolitics in modernity, this is really the source of it or the sources of it are kind of different. You know, um, on the one hand, you have the sources of the development of subjectivity in modernity, which, you know, the self-reflective subject that, you know, speaks to humanity, which doesn't exist in the Greeks. And the other source is the sort of Christian virtues like caritas, for instance, charity, you know, towards your neighbor and so on and so forth, which also don't exist in, like it's just absent from, from someone like Aristotle. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be very, I, I find it very interesting to see how do you connect, do you have an answer as to how you may connect Aristotelian virtue ethics or ancient virtue ethics, modern notions of biopolitics, working around these obstacles that I highlighted. I, I think that'll be a very interesting project or very yeah. interesting to consider. Mm. Thank you, Dimitris, uh, uh, very much. Uh, you know, I, I really want to inject a, a lot of nuance into exactly that question, you know, the extent to which we can say that there is a biopolitical concern. So, you know, of course, a lot of this is motivated by Mika Ojakanga's piece, uh, book from 2016 that makes this very strong claim that biopolitical concerns are clearly evident in uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, uh, and I, I uh, know of a forthcoming piece of his where he he will argue uh, he's argued that about Aristotle uh, in that book especially, but there's a piece that's focused particularly on Plato, as well. And I I just think that that we do really want to pause and think carefully about 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 even what the Greek would be that would allow us to translate some of those concepts, right? So. Um, you know, I think that the uh, part of the point of a kind of uh, desire to see this work in uh, Plato and Aristotle is to to get at the kind of degree of intimacy that that law is supposed to have for both Plato and Aristotle in the sort of daily lives of citizens, right, where so much of their lives is is, is intended to be regulated, but we really have to grapple with that notion of toward what end. Uh, so that gets at Demetrius that question of whether we see a version of bare life in Aristotle. And I've argued that we do not when it comes to his understanding of Zoe. Uh, he very rarely uses Zoe in the sense of mere life. What we far more often see is that Zoe is most vividly expressed in the actions that are most uh, that are most distinctive of particular living beings. So while I think Agamben is right to point to the importance of the fact that there are two words in ancient Greek that we might translate as life, Zoe and Bios, what looks to me to be far more a spur to Aristotle's thinking is the fact that he has to use the same word to describe the nutritive capacity of the plant, the perception of the animal, and the contemplation of the human, zane, right? These are the most vivid expressions of life in each of those forms of living being. And so we can see that, that if the challenge is to think how each of these actions that he will so clearly want to demarcate as distinct are all uh, a form of living, then we can see why a concept like bios would be attractive to him because it would allow for the drawing of finer distinctions between those things. So, so I would want to argue that if we find a correlate to bare life in Aristotle, it is not in Zoe, 
but it may be in an aspect that haunts his virtue ethics. Uh, so this gets to your, I'm sorry, very long winded way of getting to the second part of your question, Demetrius. And that is, you know, Aristotle's ethics is, is sort of disturbed by this notion that we might as humans simply fail to live up to what he perceives to be the rigors of character development, that we might become soft, that we might simply not develop uh, our capacities for virtue uh, and, and, and thus be, in his language, lower than the beasts, more depraved than Theria. Uh, so, so is that, is depravity uh, um, uh, Aristotle's version of their life? I think that's how to ask that question. And, and I don't know yet how to answer it, but I would like the opportunity to think more about it. And, and I hope that, that that is also helpful to, to your question. All right, well, <clears throat> um, I might uh, uh, take the chair's privilege of asking the last question, or, or rather a, a sort of mix of, of question and, and observation, um, and moving in a, a slightly different, perhaps more historical direction. I was thinking about Charles's question, when he was asking about what might be the bridges between Homer and Aristotle. Um, one, one possible bridge, of course, is via a very concrete example of embodied animality in the practice of, of in, in the actual practice of the Greek city, which is in Sparta. Yeah. Um, Sparta, of course, you know, looms large for Plato and Aristotle as a kind of an ideal city, for better or worse, rightly or wrongly. Um, but it's also one in which those metaphors that you find in Homer are concretized mm -hmm. um, as descriptions. So for instance, off the top of my head, I think of Alcman's Parthenon, where the, the ritual of the rites of passage for young girls is thematized as, as a horse race, um, mm -hmm. where um, I think it's, is it Plato who says that the cicada is a Spartan um, mm. in that whenever one goes to Sparta, it's, it's a place that's full of choruses and song. Um, mm. And that, that, that here is not a metaphor uh, mm -hmm. for, of, of swarms of animals, but rather the Spartans themselves understand their singing is kind of as very much cicada-like. And you can take that even one step further in that the, the word in, in Laconia for the bands of young men as they're kind of being socialised into citizenship is agelai which means herds, right? Yeah. So, so the whole of Sparta was understood to be this kind of way of metaphorizing aspects of civic organization through these collectivities of animality, right? Yeah. And, I, I, and Aristotle himself was, you know, he knew this intimately, you know, he, he produced a, a constitution of the Lacedaemonians and so on, and he writes extensively about Sparta and the politics. Um, it strikes me that the, the, one of the bridges between Homer and Aristotle is that what a, a literary sensibility might take to be mere metaphor in Homer mm -hmm. turns out in practice on the ground to be more than metaphor. It turns out mm -hmm. to be a kind of unconcealment of the relationship between animal and human. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's not really a question. It's just a sort of an observation, really. But yeah. I, I just thought that, that that really stimulated my thinking um, about about Sparta and about and about Sparta as a kind of place of ideal civic organisation, which turns out at its core to have all of these um, realised metaphors, if you like, or embodied metaphors of animal yeah. organisation. Yeah. Yeah, Ben, thank you. I mean, I, I, I think your observation just stands as thought provoking and right uh, as a direction in which to kind of continue some of this thinking. I, you know, what I've been working on very, like most immediately recently uh, has really been taken up with like two things that I think might be relevant. One, just the account of the longevity of trees in uh, the Parva Naturalia. So, so there, what we get is a kind of account of living embodiment that seems very non-hierarchical, uh, very sort of, uh, um, you know, polyarchic and uh, lateral, right? So the tree is long lived because it embraces both its living and its dying, because its organic structure is 
so malleable and flexible that it has root and trunk in every part. And there Aristotle will say, you know, that's because it has zoe, it has the RK of zoe in every part. And that distinguishes plant life from animal life because animal life has a principle of hierarchy. Animal life has a centralized uh, uh, principle of life and the plant has a decentralized principle of life. So, so it's not anarchic, but it's polyarchic. Uh, and animal life is, is fundamentally hierarchical for Aristotle. If that is the case, then embodiment as rule can't be read simply as metaphor. It, it, I think, must be read then as a kind of programmatic statement about the nature of life. Uh, and that programmatic statement, I think, then serves all kinds of nefarious things. And so, you know, one thing that I think we do get from Aristotle is a use of a concept of Zoe for a kind of like structurally oppressive uh, form of human political life. That's not to say that that's all that we, we get out of Aristotle, but I think that this insistence on animal life as, as hierarchically oriented, as having a centralized principle, uh, means that when he goes to talk about polis regulation in embodied terms, we can't simply read that as a metaphor. So that is just as a way of uh, affirming your, um, your observation, Ben. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, and uh, I, I believe there is time just for one further question. I think Tristan, um, you want to ask a question? Thanks for fitting me in. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, my question intersects with a few of the others that have already been um, said, but um, it focuses on the part of the history of animals when Aristotle's describing uh, herd-like creatures and um, solitary creatures. Yeah. Um, and he famously says that, that humans are dualizers in that way we partake of both yeah. traits and characteristics. Um, and I bring it up because uh, I'm, I'm curious about the way um, those words are translated. So the words are um, monadikos for solitary. Um, and as Ben already said, um, uh, the herd or herd like is agelaya. Um, and uh, it strikes me that it doesn't quite seem <clears throat> adequate, especially when um, monadikos in other Greek literature is more frequently translated as um, unique or singular. Mm -hmm. um, and solitary is, has a different kind of connotation there. Um, mm -hmm. But I wondered whether uh, Aristotle's, um, you know, influence, uh, sorry, the influence of Homer on Aristotle could actually uh, illuminate this a little bit, because of course, um, what do the Iliadic, what do the Homeric poems um, display, but both extreme forms of herd-like activity, as you've, um, you know, brought up for us today, but also incredible, uh, uniqueness or uh, I don't quite want to say antisocial behavior, but I mean, you think of Ajax or, um, or Odysseus, you know, like, I mean, all of them basically. Um, so I wondered if you could um, reflect a little bit on, on how you might translate monadikos there. Or what's the, what's the valence of monadikos there and how human beings are both monadikos and herd like at the same time when we yeah. think about it through the Homeric poems. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tristan. It's such a great question. I spend a lot of time working on that notion of humans as dualizers in the uh, Aristotle book, uh, just because it is so striking. Uh, you know, the suggestion would seem to be that, that like, the fail that 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 a kind of antisociality is within the human horizon, and so so we're not simply permitted to say, well, humans who behave in polyphemus like ways, for instance, are aberrant and pathological. Uh, uh, that rejection of collective life is within the horizon of the human. Um, you know, there is some really work on the technical term uh, that we translate as dualizer, and so you know we. Do need to be careful about how it applies to humans as distinct from like the cetaceous kind, which is also a dualizer. Uh, 
But I think it even granted that the point still stands that if, if we take that as uh, saying something significant about what falls within the human capacity, then I do think we better understand these statements that Aristotle will make that, you know, without a city and without laws, the human is the most depraved. And especially with things like food and sex, right, with the things that are associated with touch and so with what connect us to uh, the baseline of, of perceptual capacity and animality. So that, that idea of, of dualizing between social and antisocial, I think, is really significant. But your question is really about the actual sense of monadikos there and whether it, it has this, this sense of being alone or isolated or, or you know, more actively rejecting um, social uh, norms. And I think that uh, uh, that's a very interesting question. I mean, um, David DePew has this really interesting interpretation that looks uh, at the terms that sort of distinguish political animals from non-political animals along a spectrum rather than a kind of uh, rupture. Um, so we've got sporadicos as well as monadicos, right? So sporadicos in the sense of like far flung uh, that, that may be doing the work of isolation uh, and reserving then monadicos for this sort of more like active rejection of, um, of uh, political uh, life or, or collective life or, or living together. So I think that's a piece definitely worth taking a look at on this specific question of, of uh, translation. But I think more broadly, you're absolutely right to call our attention to this thing that, that Aristotle is asserting there, because it does have really important implications for what we think falls within uh, uh, a kind of uh, sense of the political nature of humans. Like if humans are the political animal who can refuse political life, uh, then that changes the picture quite a bit. And that does bring us into the realm of, of some of Hannah Arendt's thinking in a, in a productive way, I think, uh, as an overlap with Aristotle. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Well, it, it strikes me that um, <clears throat> we could keep having these conversations uh, in it for hours, but um, it's now getting into the late evening where you are, I think, and it's probably time for you to have some dinner and, you know, and, and to relax. And so we'll, we'll take this opportunity now to, to, uh, to, to stop, but also to thank you very, very much for participating in our workshop and sharing uh, these extraordinary ideas with us. So um, yes, if, if you'll all join me in oh. um, either clapping or virtually clapping with your, your little yellow hands. Um, thank you. Thank you all thank you very so much. very much for hanging in there for this very uh, long period of time for uh, your questions and uh, for your collective thinking. I'm very grateful. So thank you all. And thank you, especially thank Tristan and Ben. Thank, thank you very much. All right. Um, and we'll see you all at the next workshop, which will be in a month's time.